Now, for months, we've heard the warnings from care leaders. They say the sector is on its knees with around 100,000 posts unfilled. Yeah, and with in an effort to try to ease the pressure on the industry, ministers are introducing new rules today, allowing people from overseas to apply for some of those vacant roles. But some providers say the costs and administration involved in employing overseas workers could become a huge burden. Zoe Conway has been to one care home to find out what the changes mean for them. At the Griffin Lodge Care Home in Stockport, they're baking. The residents here have autism or learning disabilities. Many have complex physical needs. In short, they need intensive support from care workers they can rely on. Yet, as manager Karen Loxton explains, this care home is short-staffed. Just talk me through the board and what are these red circles? So this is our rotor for this coming week which staff we're expecting in, which days. The red circles are actually where we've got vacancies and we're still trying to get some cover. It's the beginning of the week, you've still got vacancies this week. Does this yeah. stuff keep you awake at night? It does. And I'm here at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, half seven, to make sure the staff are in. And if they're not in, then we're on the phone. Can you come in? Can you cover? Can you do a bit extra? It Can sounds stressful. It? It needs, the people that we support need this. This home is part of a group which should be employing 3,500 care workers. Instead, it has 500 vacancies. It's thinking of taking advantage of the government's decision to allow more care workers into the country from abroad. I welcome anything that will help ease the recruitment situation that, as a sector, we find ourselves in. So, any support. Every little bit helps. But the decision is not straightforward. Under the government scheme, care companies would have to pay overseas staff £10.10 10 an hour, which is more than some companies pay their UK resident workers. The government announced that immigration rules would be relaxed for care workers on Christmas Eve and care companies would need to apply to the Home Office for a licence. Several care companies have told the BBC that they've found the application process stressful, bureaucratic, or as care home owner Faisal says... It's horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous. So, for me, like, this is the first time I've, I've done this, um, um, th this process. Um, and I'd like to think of myself as quite a competent person that, that, um, that is able to, to, to pick up new skills or, or, or use new processes. You have to wait eight weeks um, for the application to be assessed. Once the application is assessed, that doesn't mean that you're, you're um, getting the staff there and then. That's just you getting the licence. Then you, you might have to wait another six weeks, six to eight weeks to get the staff. So that's four months. In a statement, the Home Office said that the care sector is experiencing unprecedented challenges and that adding care workers to the list of eligible occupations for visas will alleviate some of the pressures. They also said that most licence applications are decided within less than eight weeks and there's an expedited option to get a decision within ten working days. Rashid Rattour was a doctor in Pakistan. He came to Britain to work in Sudbury in Suffolk as a senior care worker, one of the jobs that's already on the occupation shortage list. When you work in, with these people uh, uh, who are old and in need of you, you actually tend to uh, get closer to them and you tend to know them more and you tend to know the, their feelings when they need their loved ones when they're not around and you have to be everything for them. If you can calm and bring a smile to a person who's sad, uh, that smile is, I think, uh, is, the, is the core of what you actually can achieve out of care. What's not clear is how long this new care worker visa will be available for. Will it simply alleviate short-term pressures or could it become a permanent solution to the sector's staffing crisis? Zoe Conway, BBC News. Well, we're joined now in the studio by Mark Adams, who's from Community Integrated Care. And that, that's one of your care homes, is it, that, yeah. that Zoe's reporting yeah, from? Of course. Um, so a, a big change, potentially, this, that you're able to recruit from abroad more, that, that, that care workers go onto this list. But what, what's the reality? What are you thinking about? 
Well, I, I guess to start with a positive, you know, the, there's 1.5 million people in the UK working in social care, looking after a similar number of people that need support. So we need access to labour markets where we can attract values-based colleagues who've got the um, personality, the talent to do this kind of work. So on that basis, this is good. The problem is that it should have been there from the beginning. You know, we should never have had social care workers referred to as low skilled, which is what Priti Patel did when she excluded them the first time. Um, and the other thing is that they're, they're putting a barrier of £10 and £10 an hour to, f to fulfil an eligibility for this. And that's the level as a minimum that we should be paying people in the UK, irrespective of going abroad. And potentially causes tension between workers. If you have a foreign worker coming in and earning more than you, it might make you, again, in an already pressured job, yeah. think twice about whether it's worth it. Well, I mean, most local authorities pay about £8.91 pence an hour to allow somebody to work in social care. If you're bringing in somebody on £10.10, .10, you know, that inequality in a workforce where you've got a small, tight team. I mean, on Griffin Lodge there that we've just seen, I think there are 12 people supported with a similar number of staff. Um, and if you would suddenly say there are three or four people coming in paid more than the others, and the others might have been there for five, ten years, where, where is the equity in that? So what does that mean for, for you in terms of paying staff? I mean, well, you know, how much you, you need staff, you need people, but, yeah. but paying out more money is, it has a massive impact. I well, I, th I think this is what really the sector is calling out for. I mean, this is a good initiative. It does give us something that we can think about. But the reality is that we need a workforce plan for the whole sector. We need something that has a vision for five and ten years hence. I mean, we, we uh, last year put our pay rate up to uh, £9.70 an hour, which is way above um, minimum wage. It was actually above real living wage, but it was costing the charity about £2 million a year of our reserves because we were going into losses to do it. And even with that, we have 500 vacancies on a workforce of 3,500 on the front line, and we've got about uh, another 500 who are off sick at any one time. So we're desperate for the right people coming in and we just need the government to support local government and say we'll put the money in that these people deserve. Do you feel like you've said this before though because I've spoken to you before last year and you said they just need to listen we need to recognize this as a highly skilled important job yeah. that we have to pay for but nobody wants to pay for it. Until it becomes politically painful people don't like making tough decisions uh, you've got um, an NHS now that's costing over 220 billion a year a properly funded social care system is probably going to get to the thick end of 100 billion a year and the country arguably can't afford that but rather than come out and admit it and say let's work on a solution let's look at different ways of doing things there is a pretense that there's enough money in the system and there isn't and the sector has been crying out not just through covid but really for the last 10 years for, for help and ultimately service users people who are legally entitled to care are not getting it no, and this is the thing, that 30% of people that join the social care in any one year leave. Uh, they come in, they find the work very rewarding, but very hard, and they're underpaid. And with 30% of people that join leaving, those are emerging relationships with the vulnerable people that you've seen today. You know, it's a bit like a bereavement. If you've had somebody you build a relationship with and suddenly they're out of your life, it really is emotionally tough for them and emotionally tough for their colleagues as well. And for those people who say, you know, the industry should have been paying better wages for longer anyway, that if you paid people properly, you wouldn't have this problem. What do you say? Well, I mean, you know, Gillian Keegan came in as the social care minister and started saying there's more than enough money in the system. It's just employers not managing their staff properly, uh, not creating the right culture, not motivating their staff. And I mean, frankly, after two years of COVID, that's an insult. I think it's a great sector with great leaders and great teams, but we just need a, a recognition and support from local government who needs support from national government. Okay, Mark, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you thank very you much. Message there. Thank you.